City Council beginning to push back on Jacksonville's energy utility. The latest moves toward telling JEA to stop exploring a sale and why it's urgent but not an official emergency. Brenda Priestley Jackson joins us. Before you know it, we'll be in presidential preference primary season. So what's the right fit for Florida? We're talking to a former lawmaker who wants things changed to include every voter. And consider it, should you skip a week this winter? We'll dig into the details of a campaign to have you water less and maybe help save a billion gallons of water on This Week in Jacksonville. Thanks so much for joining us today. You know, each day of the week, it seems there's another lead story or headline about JEA, JEA that is Duval County's public-owned utility. So right now, we're joined by City Council Member Brenda Priestley-Jackson, and thank you for joining us. I asked you to join us because you put forward some legislation that was basically about telling JEA to stop the negotiating process as this utility explores privatization. And then there was a vote. And then there was an amendment. And so maybe just uh, quickly explain what happened this week in city council with that. Okay. So I advanced a resolution. It was an emergency resolution to require the JEA board to rescind or withdraw the ITN. I filed it actually last Wednesday. Um, it, it was noticed to the public on, I think, Thursday, and I had a notice meeting on Friday. And what happened at the city council meeting, before you can get to the substantive legislation, even though the two were intermingled. To me, it's an emergency because we found out about a series of acts, right? Um, you have to have a vote by the council on declaring a matter an emergency. And so to have a matter declared an emergency, you need 13 votes of a 19-member council. And we did not get the 13 votes for that. We got nine votes on the emergency. That was not surprising to me because a fair number of my colleagues had shared I'm with you, I support you, but I'm not comfortable with the emergency. And so based on that, and that's when I said, when we had debate, actually, which was a very good thing, and thank Council President Wilson for allowing us to share our positions and for me to share why I thought it was an emergency. After that, Councilman Newby moved to amend the item, not having an emergency that night, but a one-cycle emergency. So still to deem an emergency, but instead of going through the regular committee cycle with council, which can start at, um, you know, six weeks, but really go on an infinite number of weeks, it, we go to committee me meetings one week, and then we will hear it at the next meeting. I agree to that with one stipulation. There is widespread concern by the public that with the neg negotiations going on in Atlanta, Atlanta with the lack of candor and openness to the city council, the employees at JA, the ratepayers, that something would happen um, with the JA board that would preclude them from hearing the resolution. And so they have a notice meeting next week on the 17th, but if you recall, they canceled their meeting in November. in November. And after reviewing the charter and kind of talking with general counsel and some others, I realized we had no ability to make them meet so I inserted language that said that upon passage, this resolution has to be the first item addressed on their agenda, whether it's a regular board meeting or a special board meeting and prior to any the ITM being addressed. Yeah. So I appreciate you explaining that. Do you feel like because there weren't those 13 members on council that you weren't getting the right kind of support? And really this, the, by delaying it and saying it's a one cycle or even one week, it pushes it back about a month because it can't get through to a vote for full city council until I believe January 14th. January maybe. 14th. We actually start recess next week. So the council's on holiday recess. Right. And so um, we, we wouldn't meet then. Um, no, I don't think it, it, it evidences any reluctance about my colleagues on the council addressing um, the needs of our community and these concerns that have been brought to light with that one of our most valuable assets, the JA utility. I think it just, I had to realize they hadn't been dancing with it for the last six weeks like maybe I had when I started looking into the issues. And there was a different level of awareness and comfort um, regarding what facts were before them and some needed it. And, and just in general, we try to have an attitude on the council that's been encouraged by Council President Wilson to give colleagues as much time as they need on something. I wanted it addressed on Tuesday, but I told them I can count. So if I did not, <laughs> if I did not, you know, agree to the one cycle emergency and the amendment, the item would have failed on an emergency. Then it would have gone to the regular cycle, right. which could be at least that. Yeah, we did. And, 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 and yeah. quite candidly, you know, we lost the one half cent sales tax issue because of that very issue that it just got delayed and delayed and delayed until it was withdrawn. So I want to point out something here. In the past several weeks, there have been questions uh, about ethics, incentives, outsourcing lawyers, consultants fees. 
So this is what the chief customer officer at JEA, Carrie Stewart, who's recently been a guest with us here, but this is what she told Jim Pickett recently regarding the people on the negotiating team and the State Ethics Commission weighing in. Why ask the state to look at this then? Is there a problem? Well, we don't know if there's a problem, but out of an abundance of caution, we want to make sure that we're crossing every T and dotting every I. We're trying to be overly transparent. So we reached out to the State Ethics Commission to ask them to weigh in on our negotiators. And I've heard that from a, a number of people associated with JEA or on the, the C-suite level. Uh, hey, we want to be transparent. Do you feel like this process has been transparent? Absolutely not. And quite candidly, reaching out to the State Ethics Commission to have members of the negotiating team replaced by members of the mayor's staff does not necessarily fuel notions of transparency. Some may ask, by extension, is it now the mayor's office that will pick the contract? as opposed to those who are experienced in negotiations of this magnitude. So I, I mean, I understand that that's the reason, the rationale they get advanced for doing it. I don't know that it fuels transparency. One more thing here, and I'll show you some video here. Uh, a week ago, JEA leadership avoiding questions from our City Hall reporter, Jim Pickett. Melissa Dykes, the President and Chief Operating Officer, she effectively closed the door on Jim as he tried to get comments from her. That, that's also the essence of Jim's attempt to get clarification from the JEA board chair, April Green Monday, when she said that she thought JEA needed, and here's her quote, to be able to press the restart button on some of what has happened over the last 90 days. So, Councilwoman, what, what's your biggest concern regarding how this process is going and the lack of... Yeah, I'll answer those questions directly from some of the leadership in JEA. Well, I don't think they've done that, and they've had numerous opportunities to do it. So let's note that um, the, the chair of the JEA board, Mrs. Green, and um, the, Mrs. Dykes and a member of the executive staff were with the members of the city council for our JEA workshop on Monday. They couldn't answer questions in the workshop. They couldn't say what charter changes should be proposed, nor could they explain how they changed paths after ending a meeting in June indicating that they were going to pursue a traditional utility response with charter revisions after having passed a resolution a year prior saying they would not pursue privatization. Right. And then outside of the sunshine, having a meeting on the 23rd of July where they pursue pr privatization by issuing an ITN, not duly noticed to the public, and then they amend their agenda at the end to conform to the actions taken at that meeting which is to issue the ITN, at the very same meeting that they enter, they agree to performance pay for members of the executive team and employees based on selling the utility. I mean, that's just wrought with ethical conflicts and dilemmas and a lack of transparency. There have been calls. Uh, our political analyst Rick Mullaney is one of them, R. L. Gundy in the community, others who have said, we need an investigation. And I know you're not practicing criminal law right now, but as a lawyer, do you see the need for that? Should there be an outside investigation of what's happened here with JEA? I think there, I think there has to be an inquiry. I, again, I'm not a, an expert in that area at all. Um, I think at a very minimum that it has not conformed to the Florida statutes as well as to Sunshine, right? So Sunshine presumes open meetings. Open meetings mean due process, notice, and an opportunity to be heard. Surely folks would have shown up at that JEA meeting if they knew they were going to even discuss privatization, but the last thing they told the public for the last year or more was they weren't going to do that. Um, those incentive, pass, you know, the pay for performance incentive plan, way beyond my scope in terms of implications, but just the overarching idea that you're going to incentivize folks who are charged with the decision of whether we're going to sell our municipal utility yeah. by selling the municipal utility. Yeah. You know, that, there, there is just a lot. But, but, you know, I'm going to say something that maybe doesn't hearken to, to legal standards in terms of Sunshine or the charter, which was a lack of notice to our council auditors. There's a presumption that we're going to work in the best interest of our neighbors in Jacksonville. That means members of city council. Um, that means folks in the community. That means the JEA board. That means every day. Our council president, Scott Wilson, met with the, the members of the executive team and board about their meeting that Tuesday on July 17th or 18th, that Thursday prior. And there was no mention given to him that they had changed course. And so, I mean, that's just Surprise. bad. Surprise. No mention. He, they didn't mention it at all, right? And, 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 and I just, I can't believe if you don't duly notice a meeting and have an agenda that conforms with what you plan to do and it's so radically different from what you said you would do a month prior that you truly want the public engaged and informed or more importantly, you didn't already know what course of action you wanted to mm -hmm. pursue. 
Um, I have felt all along that the desire was to get so far down this path that we could not intervene. And that's just never my attitude. You know, I believe I'm held accountable for acting when something comes to my attention and doing my due diligence, and that's what I want to do. Well, I appreciate uh, explaining what's been happening so far and uh, your efforts, and uh, thanks for taking the time this morning. Thank you so much for allowing me to share. All right. So stay with us. We're tackling a state and local voting topic next. Former Congressman Jason Altmaier explains his position on open primaries. That's next on This Week in Jacksonville. While some folks are dreaming of a white Christmas, Jenkins does things a little different. Right now, during the Hyundai Holiday Sales Event at Jenkins Hyundai of Jacksonville, unwrap a new Hyundai with 0% interest up to 72 months. And don't pay a thing till spring. Lease a new Elantra for just $149 a month. A new Hyundai Tucson or Kona, just $199 a month. Or get the gift of 0% and don't pay a thing till spring. Now at Jenkins Hyundai of Jacksonville on Atlantic Boulevard. Welcome to the family. Serving with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office for over 24 years and living in this community all my life, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. I've been the victim of a crime. I know how victims feel. My number one goal as News for Jack's crime and safety expert is keep you informed, keep you aware, and most of all, keep you safe. I want to be able to provide that kind of perspective so that people will know everything is under control. Watch News for Jax every night starting at 5, the local station. Thank you for once again making News 4 Jax your number one local station. The I-Team warned parents about a popular over-the-counter herb with lethal consequences. We showed you the local stores selling the most winning lottery tickets. And got results for families fighting for renters' rights. News for Jax, number one all morning long. And number one at 5, 5.30, 6 o'clock, and your number one choice at night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Car accidents don't care about time. They don't believe in nine to five, so neither do we. We're right here, ready to take your call any time of the day or night, 24-7, 365. There's no good time to have an accident, so we make sure there's no bad time to call Farrah and Farrah. We're here now, we'll be here later. In fact, we've been here protecting you and your family day or night since 1979. Car accidents never rest, so neither do we. This year, the gift you really want is at Nissan's year-end event. Get holiday savings on our tech-filled lineup, like Rogue or Altima, both with available Safety Shield 360. Hurry in. Holiday offers end soon. Save up to three thousand on the 2020 Rogue, or get zero percent financing for up to seventy-two months on twelve models. Jacksonville, your girl is moving to 3 o'clock on Channel 4. Anyone got any boxes I can borrow? I'm just... Okay. Kelly's making moves. Super hot. Starting Monday, catch Kelly. Weekdays at 3. That's what I got you, boo. Wendy at 2, Kelly at 3. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. Does anyone have any diamonds I can borrow? Or I'll take them. New lineup starts Monday. Wendy at 2, Kelly at 3. Weekdays on Channel 4. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. So when it comes to voting in Florida, are we leaders or laggers? There's an argument to be made that the Sunshine State has led the nation on election reform. Joining us today and for the first time in a while, Jason Altmaier, former member of the House of Representatives and uh, also an author. And we've talked about your most recent book, uh, Dead Center. Uh, so, Congressman, you've written a little bit about uh, something that Florida Supreme Court has been taking up recently, open primary. So explain your view, and, and maybe we'll talk about what should happen in your view here in Florida. In an open primary system, all the candidates are on the same ballot regardless of party affiliation. Everybody running for office, Republicans, Democrats, Greens, Libertarians, Independents, Reform Party, all on the same ballot, and every voter votes regardless of party affiliation. So independents are allowed to vote, and the top two go into the general election. And what that does, if you're running for office currently in a closed primary system, A, one third of the electorate is locked out of that process. One third of Florida voters are uh, no party affiliation, independents, they can't vote in the primary. Yet their tax dollars fund those very primaries from which they're excluded. 
that's one issue. The bigger issue is when all voters vote, if you're a candidate running for office, in that situation, you have to appeal across the spectrum, not just to the narrow base extreme within your own party, as is currently the case with closed primaries. If you want to win in an open primary, you have to appeal to everybody. You have to appeal not just to your own party, but to people in the center and even people in the other party. And in states where this has been enacted, like California, for example, uh, research has shown that both in Sacramento and in Washington, D.C., their congressional delegations and their state legislative delegations get along more. They compromise more. And candidates, when running for office, don't use the extreme partisan rhetoric because they know that that's going to turn off the majority of the people that they need to support. But that's them. certainly something we've seen over the last several years is it, it's, it feels like it gets more extreme. Yeah. Um, it, and I guess from your perspective, is that bad for the country. Uh, you've talked in your book about being uh, a yeah. centrist, somebody who's trying to do what most people want in terms of governance, right? I travel all over the country talking about political polarization and election reform, and I get asked all the time, why is there so much partisanship in Washington? And the answer is very simple. It's because we elect partisans. We have a system that is designed to elect and protect people on the far extremes of the two political parties. What open primaries does is it gives voice to people in the center. It doesn't give them a greater advantage. It just allows them to have a voice in the representative when currently, as I said, one-third of independent voters are locked out of the process entirely. So one of the things that uh, brought us to this conversation was that uh, All Voters Vote, an uh, organization pushing a 2020 ballot initiative that supporters say would push the reset button on democracy. And Florida State Supreme Court here heard arguments uh, first week of this month. The Attorney General, Ashley Moody, said, hey, court, you should reject this. So do you think it, it stands a chance of, of being enacted or coming this year even? It does stand a chance. I think it will be on the ballot in November of 2020, and voters will then decide. And the reason that you know you're on the right side of something is when both the party apparatuses oppose it. They yeah. can very rarely agree on anything, but they do agree <laughs> that they don't want to open up the process to allow all voters to vote because that takes control away from the party apparatus and gives it back to the voter. So let me ask, I guess, playing devil's advocate, don't members of those parties have a right to choose who their representative is going to be without interference from people who aren't affiliated? That's the private club argument where you have a Republican Party and a Democratic Party and they should choose. And they're very uh, free and able to do that except for the fact, as I said, the tax dollars of every Florida taxpayer pays for those very elections that they're excluding one-third of Florida voters. So that, that argument doesn't hold water when you look at the fact that you want to hold A, an election where all voters can vote, and B, you want every taxpayer to be able to participate in the elections that they're paying for. So you wrote an op-ed for U.S. News & World Report, and the headline was yeah. catchy. Uh, it says, vote down your crazy uncle. So <laughs> your point here is that partisan politics makes candidates try to appeal to the extremes rather than the center, right? Right, and that was in, in the Thanksgiving uh, holiday. You're talking about e e everyone has a family or a friend party. that comes and talks <laughs> politics, but you don't want that person determining the outcome of elections. You want everyone to be able to participate and have the center and the more moderate voters be able to determine who the outcome. So we're talking specifically about Florida. And I think there's some, there's a lot of people who are going to watch this and say, hey, I don't want to be like, name the state, California or Wyoming or whatever it is. But this is a little bit of a national movement as well, right? Oh, it's very much a national movement. And you look at New York City just went to ranked choice voting, which is a, a similar uh, theory issue. Uh, Maine, the same type of thing. So election reform is happening all across the country because I think people are tired of the polarization that they see in their state capitals and in Washington. And they're looking for ways to engage the center and more moderate voters. And open primaries is a way to do that. Maybe we'll wrap up here. But the city of Jacksonville, when we did municipal elections in this last year, there was a vote in March. And then whoever the top two candidates were, if it wasn't more than 50 percent for one right. candidate, they moved on, regardless of party affiliation. Is that a similar notion? It's similar. Yeah, it, it's certainly better than a closed primary system, which incentivizes the extremes. Yeah. Jason Altmaier, we don't get together enough. We should do this more. I appreciate hearing your perspective and certainly uh, hearing a view on, on why maybe things should change here in voting. Thank you for having me. All right.
Well, a big change in topics just ahead. Winter time tips about water quality and water supply. The leader of St. John's River Water Management District is our next guest, so stay with us on This Week in Jacksonville. Subaru of Jacksonville has big savings and donations during the Subaru Share the Love event. Drive a new 2020 Forester for just $229 a month or 0% financing. Experience the Subaru of Jacksonville difference. Donating $500 with every new Subaru sold. Drive a Subaru. You'll buy a Subaru. Tired of being a number? At 121 Financial Credit Union, you are our member, an owner, not a number. Since 1935, hardworking families and businesses have trusted us with their banking. Experience our friendly and personal service today. Federally insured by the NCUA. I don't think about our clients from just 9 to 5. Injuries and livelihoods are much more than 9 to 5. Your trust deserves more. It demands long hours, dedication, preparation, and understanding. My clients see me, text me, call me, are with me in their homes and in the courtrooms. The pursuit of justice does not stop and neither will I, because in the end, it is about you. Harold and Harold, don't settle for less than you deserve. What treasure lies before us? Order whenever you're ready, sir. Oh, all right. Take yourself on a taste adventure with a new Smokehouse Cheddar Barbecue Filet Sandwich with hand-breaded chicken, smoky bacon, and onion rings on Texas toast. One of two brand new sandwich meals for a limited time only at Zaxby's. And don't miss Jumanji The Next Level, only in theaters. On the economy, a unique leader, Mike Bloomberg's created over 400,000 jobs. As president, an opportunity economy that works for us. Tax fairness, where the wealthy pay their fair share. Education, affordable college and high-skill vocational training so people can succeed in the new economy. Economic security, lower-cost health care, and affordable middle-class housing. Proven leadership on jobs to build an economy where people don't just get by, they get ahead. I'm Mike Bloomberg, and I approve this message. I paid the price. You paid too much. For loving you. No, oh, for your glasses. They charged you too much. Who? Practically anyone who isn't America's best. Wear two pairs and a free exam are just $69.95. It's not just a better deal. It's America's best. We weren't happy with our bathtub. But we didn't want the headaches of demolition. Or the days without our bathroom. Then a friend told us about Bath Fitter and their unique tub-over-tub -tub process. There's no demolition, and they install in as little as a day. They also have a seamless wall for a watertight fit. And Bath Fitter has a lifetime guarantee. What a difference. Finally, a bathtub I love. The Subaru Share the Love event brings big year-end savings and $500 donations with every new Subaru sold at Subaru of Jacksonville. Buy the all-new 2020 Outback for just $26,509, plus complimentary lifetime warranty or two years maintenance. Drive a Subaru. You'll buy a Subaru. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. St. John's River Water Management District Executive Director Dr. Ann Shortell is joining us. And we're talking specifically about water conservation here in Jacksonville, really across our region. Uh, I wanted to bring up, there's a campaign you're working on called Water Lesson. And there's this catchphrase that uh, caught my attention, skip a week. What is that? Why is that important? So in the wintertime, our yards need less water because it's cooler and uh, the, everything kind of goes dormant, doesn't grow as much. Well, that, that makes me think, oh, maybe it needs more water. I mean, that's, that's not the right answer, that's but that might be an assumption. That's why we're having this water less <laughs> campaign so that people will understand that not only is it okay to water less, we're encouraging it because we can save water. Uh, residents can uh, sp spend less money on water, right? Their utility bills will be lower and the grass will actually be stronger in the spring because the roots deepen. You only need to water every 10 That's to 14 days That's in the interesting. winter. That's so, uh, interesting. So if I've got a sprinkler system that automatically waters, you know, once a week, twice a week, whatever, do I have to just turn that off or am I trying to program it a different way? Or? I would encourage you to turn it off and only turn it back on if for some reason we don't get rain you know, timely. So that's the skip a week. 
because otherwise the sprinklers are going to come on whether or not your grass needs the water or not. Well, yeah, I think you just kind of uh, inferred this, but one of the things that caught my attention, your webpage says it's the best time to train your yard to need less water. Wait, wait a second. I can train my grass? Well, that I, I should water less? Training of sorts, right? So at this time of year, because the, er, the growth cycle is slowing down, if you water more, it, you are encouraging the roots to stay really, really shallow, and then your lawn actually needs more water when it warms up in the spring. When it's dormant, let everything go deep and then it's very healthy when the rains come back. So I, I wanna show some uh, information that, that we pulled from the campaign and everything. One of these is about too much irrigation. The effects of it says, make your lawn less able to survive droughts, because we know we'll have those at some point, encourages pests and disease, and it wastes water. How much is enough? Well, grass doesn't need as much water in the cooler months, you mentioned that. Uh, apply half inch, three quarters of an inch of water, and only every 10 to 14 days. And then the third thing is that how do I know when to water the lawn, when the blades of the grass are folded in half, when they are blue-gray, or when my footprint stays on the lawn? That's when I know it needs some attention, That's right? That's the easiest thing. If you walk across your yard and you leave footprints in the grass, maybe it's time to give it a little water. Yeah, so maybe a minute or less. Explain to us why water conservation is important, because maybe somebody's watching this and say, well, I've never really thought about it. Well, so our residents can, can save money, which is awesome, but think about it. We get water in Florida in great big gulps. Yeah. Uh, big <laughs> storms, hurricanes, and then it can get very dry. We want to keep the water on our landscape, uh, in, in our lakes, rivers, springs, and in the aquifer. Watering less allows uh, for water conservation for the drier times. It's very important. And if we all skip a week, we're going to save a billion gallons of water. That's just, uh, that's the entire state of Florida? That's just the, the Our local district. district? Our district, but all are part of 18 counties. Dr. Chateau, I, I appreciate it. Uh, I know this is something that we said, hey, let's maybe just give some education because I'm not thinking about it. I'm thinking about the holidays or I'm thinking about other stuff, but appreciate you bringing it to light today. Thank you so much for having us. All right. Well, Senate Minority Leader Audrey Gibson is with us next week. So is Lori Boyer. She's the leader of the Downtown Investment Authority. We're going to talk about the changes on the way for the urban core. All of that is coming up in the next week. And this week in Jacksonville, you know, we air each Sunday morning at this time. I'm Kent Justice. Thanks for watching on air on Channel 4 and the CW17. And you can find this episode and others online at news4jax.com. People in Northeast Florida and South Georgia get their news from News 4 Jacks than anywhere else.